Well, it's been a while since I've uh, done any of the applied series, uh, so I'll take some time today and go through a number uh, of issues. For some of you who have seen my post on LinkedIn uh, several weeks ago, you'll know that I have gone completely to cash, uh, which is the first time I've ever done that. And there were a number of drivers uh, that sort of pushed me there. I didn't start uh, November with the thought that I would uh, end, uh, end November uh, in cash. It sort of unfolded that way. And as I began to get a little more clarity uh, about the situation and what the future was going to look like, uh, not only just clarity, but also some clouding issues as well. Um, the moves I started making towards cash just made sense to continue. So I'm going to talk about a number of things today, uh, but I am going to try my best to tie it all back to the content somewhere. Uh, so we're going to talk about the notion of regime change, first of all. And we've seen this, or you will see this, uh, in level two time series, uh, where if you have a time series uh, of a, a certain length, uh, you may run the risk of having multiple regimes within your time series, which means that you won't have constant variance or you won't have stationarity uh, in the mean. So we're going to talk about regime change, and I believe we've entered... Uh, uh, a new, uh, or sorry, we've gone into a, a period of change which will issue in uh, a, new, a new regime uh, in the market uh, through something called an exogenous shock. And I think it's this second round of COVID that's really going to do it. We'll talk about cap rates because uh, I was uh, heavily in REITs. Uh, I paired back uh, my thoughts on where REITs are going to go. I don't think the next 10 years are going to deliver the returns that the last 10 years have. Uh, so as I was lightening up in, in November, November was just an explosive month in the REIT sector. Some of the names uh, that started the month uh, by, um, you know, the 8th or 9th, 10th of the month were up 30, 40 percent. Avalon Bay went from, uh, one, I was collecting uh, in the 130s, 135 to 140. I was uh, building a position. Uh, ran all the way into the 190s uh, in a period of three days, four days. How do you not take uh, uh, an almost $60 run in that short period of time? Uh, I was willing to wait two years uh, to get that kind of return out of AVB. Uh, VNO, uh, low 30s all the way into the 40s. Kimco, uh, 10, mid 10s, I was building a position all the way into the 15s. Uh, Boston Properties, low 70s, was really nice selling the puts and building a position in Boston Properties as well. Ran, it's over $100 now, ran into uh, the upper 90s before I, I got rid of it. So during the month of November, all of these REITs gave me almost two years of returns or what I thought would be two years of expected returns, all, some, some of them within a period of three or four days. So I started lightening up. And as I started thinking more about what the future was going to look like, I kept lightening up to the point where I was all in cash. Uh, and I think that only when you're all in cash can you then have a very clear perspective on what's going on. And I'm not as bullish on uh, the REIT space for the next 10 years as I was for the last 10 years. The last 10 years, uh, REITs, if you look at it on a total return basis, outperformed um, the S&P. Uh, that will not do that going forward. We'll talk about the U.S. dollar. Uh, sorry, we'll talk about uh, large cap versus small cap. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion about the rotation into small cap. I think that's a mistake. I don't think that small cap is going to be the winner uh, over the next uh, few years. I think large cap will continue to win. I have a number of arguments for that. We'll talk about the U.S. dollar uh, as well because the U.S. dollar is central to some of the decisions that I'm making in terms of shifting my allocation. Uh, and I am doing major shifts to my allocation. Uh, we'll look at commodity cycles, less energy, uh, less energy and food really, but we'll look at commodity cycles. And uh, finally, we'll look at inflation um, and we'll contrast the trend, which I think uh, is going to be more prominent over the next 10 years, which is localization over globalization. The last 20, 25 years has really been a story of globalization and lowering inflation only because uh, 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 costs were driven uh, or continually driven down uh, with globalization. Well, if you're going to reverse that and have localization, you're going to have the reintroduction of inflation, which can be a good thing, 
uh, or a bad thing, depending uh, on on how uh, on how it's handled. So let's begin with regime change. And I know this is a lot to go through, and I'm not going to go into detail about a lot of these things. I'm going to just sort of discuss the thinking uh, involved in this. We'll look at uh, what type of exogenous shock uh, has occurred. I think we all know what it is, but what, what it's done for the trajectory uh, that the economy was already on. Uh, it hasn't really changed uh, the, the path or the direction the economy was going. It has changed... Uh, the speed and the slope at which it's going to get there. Uh, so I'm going to go over uh, all of these things, uh, hopefully uh, without taking up too much of your time. Uh, and then in subsequent videos, I'll uh, have a video dedicated to each one where I'll, I'll expand more on it. So if you feel that I haven't said enough or I'm leaving some things out, it's for, for brevity. I really just want to get uh, the story out there so that you can uh, uh, maybe... Think about it and, of course, critique it. If you have some comments, of course, put them below. I will answer intelligent comments. If you're simply going to yell into your keyboard at me, I will block you. Uh, you know the rules on this channel. This is not Fox News and it's not going to turn into Fox News. All right. Well, let's think about uh, um, the digital evolution. Uh, in the late 90s, we were calling it the digital revolution. Uh, by about mid-90s, 1995, this is where the internet really started poking its head up uh, around the world saying, hey, uh, have you ever considered me in a commercial application? Uh, as opposed to it being uh, um, you know, a communications network uh, prior to that. And um, there was a big rush in the late 90s into the internet to try to figure out, well, what, it, what can we do with this thing? So almost every type of business uh, tried to move online and that all fell apart. That's the revolution part. And then after that, there was a, uh, a digital evolution where companies started to make uh, the uh, digital, uh, digital world part of their business model as well. Some fully adopting it, others sort of streamlining into it. But there was already a trend in place towards greater digitalization of the economy. Online sales were increasing each year. A lot of types of businesses had already switched fully uh, to a digital world. Music, movies uh, had already gone there. So that move was already on the way. Uh, what the first round of COVID uh, did in, in March was really accelerate the move to the digital world for a lot of businesses. But that was uh, a single shock uh, and I think a lot of businesses adjusted uh, for what they needed to adjust for, waiting to get back to normal. Well, here we are. It's the uh, winter. Um, it's back in almost every country uh, in the world. We're hitting record numbers. The U.S. is just, if you look at a chart, uh, it is just exploding. Europe was, and it's sort of coming down. And then you have some... Uh, continents that uh, are, are significantly lower but still uh, um, hitting record numbers. Record numbers of infections, record number of deaths every every single day. Not just the U.S., Canada, uh, same thing, record numbers uh, every day. Yes, there is a, a vaccine, uh, two vaccines. Uh, one is now approved in certain countries, which is the Pfizer vaccine. It has some logistic problems, negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Some, some areas of the world simply uh, don't have that kind of infrastructure in place to support that. But that's okay. There's a Moderna one uh, uh, right behind it. I think negative 20 or negative 15 or negative 20 uh, Fahrenheit for, uh, for its distribution. Um, so they exist and they're starting to get approval. However, um, there's a big difference between it existing uh, in a uh, facility, in a production facility, and it existing in bloodstreams. Uh, that is a long process that still has to go through. Uh, so you're still looking at five, six, seven months before you really start to see it becoming more mainstream. Uh, Canada today announced that it's going to get uh, 249,000 doses before the end of December. Uh, since it's a double dose, uh, that's really 124,000 uh, people that, uh, that, that can receive the vaccine out of a population of 33 million. Um, so it's, it is going to take a long time uh, to get out there. It's, it, for all intents and purposes, 
it's not over. Uh, you know, we may be halfway through hell, but that's the problem. We still have halfway to go. Uh, so uh, I think last night, California entered lockdown again. Uh, different countries have gone into uh, either full lockdown, partial lo lockdown. It's a little more focused this time than last time, none of these blanket lockdowns, but it's still happening and it's still going to cause uh, a major disruption, which means it's going to cause an even faster uh, adoption, lots of businesses have to, adoption of a digital world. So what we have, I believe, is not just a, a change uh, in the pace of acceptance uh, of a digital uh, footprint, but I think we have a significant shift uh, uh, and we're going to be on a new trajectory. Uh, the trend that we were on uh, has been uh, shifted upwards, I think, and the slope has increased dramatically, which means that pace uh, is going to happen very quickly. Um, this curve, by the way, uh, up here, has a very particular characteristic uh, associated with it. Um, when we look at economics, you talk about the marginal cost of attracting another customer. Uh, in a digital world, uh, the marginal cost of attracting a customer shrinks with size. So the bigger you get, the smaller and smaller that marginal cost becomes. About a hundred years ago, um, there was a, 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 in the economics profession, there was sort of the intellectual question of if economies of scale uh, are so powerful, why is the economy not just one big giant firm? Uh, and the answer to it was, well, diseconomies of scale because a firm will get to a certain size where managing that firm will then begin to have increasing marginal costs per customer that each time you you grow in size your marginal costs will begin to increase unless you add more scale move to a digital world reverses that scale matters size matters uh, so for scalability you want large size not small size which is why i'm leaning more towards large cap but to really understand my large cap uh, uh, trade on this one, you have to understand my position on the US dollar. So anyways, I think what you have here is you have a major disruption um, in, um, in, this dig in the transformation or the evolution towards a digital world. And this, by the way, is what I think raises the probability uh, of a recession in the near term. Q1 of 2021, Q2 of 2021. Uh, because it's this gap in here where a lot of businesses aren't going to make it. Uh, a lot of businesses lack the cash flow to actually finance their move uh, to a digital world. Uh, not only that, a digital world requires fewer employees and it requires a barbelled type uh, of labor force where you have extremely cognitive heavy work at the top in engineering the digital world and you have low cognitive tasks at the bottom in fulfilling the digital world. Uh, and it hollows out that middle sector unless you uh, move down here and start to really think about localization, which we'll get to. Um, so that disruption, this, by the way, this gap, this chasm, is what uh, uh, an economist named Schumpeter uh, referred to as creative destruction is that you have some exogenous shock that comes in that accelerates the pace of change uh, so that existing companies cannot adapt. A lot of companies and a lot of species uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the world are adaptable to a changing environment if the environment changes slow enough. Uh, when you have this kind of radical change to the environment, uh, you have mass extinction events, and I think you're going to see that with a lot of companies, these mass extinction events where a lot of them simply just uh, disappear. And it's that release of resources, including human resources, it'll be that release of resources in the face of this exogenous shock, which, which long term will be positive, but it's going to have an adjustment period in the short term that I think is going to, uh, uh, or not going to, but significantly raises the probability of a recession. Uh, in the first and second quarters of 2021. Uh, but I don't see uh, a 30-40% sell-off uh, in the indexes. In fact, I think that uh, if you get anywhere from a 10 to a 15% correction in the first or second quarter of 2021, that probably 
uh, is um, is about the extent of it. Uh, but there will be uh, a recession. I don't think it'll be a long one. I think it'll last, uh, you know, uh, the first quarter, second quarter, maybe into the third. But once we get into the fourth quarter, into the fall, that uh, sort of seems to be the consensus projection on when enough vaccines will be in bloodstreams that it will have made a difference. That you'll still have cases. This time next year, there will still be cases, but they'll be uh, small enough. It'll be sort of like the flu where, yes, every year people go to the hospital because of the flu. It gets bad enough, it'll, it'll be uh, pushed down uh, to that level. So this right here is uh, one reason, uh, you know, I sort of looked at what happened in November. I said, I think we're, we're pricing in way too much. We're pricing in the fact that the vaccine is, is for all intents and purposes in bloodstreams and it's not. Getting it from the factory into bloodstreams is still a, a, a significant period of time while this thing is still out there. And uh, uh, just sort of a smaller uh, issue is uh, the market in November priced in a win by a political party. I think that if it would have been Trump uh, that won, clearly, or Biden that won, it would have been the same reaction. Uh, the reaction was a decision decisiveness, good, it it would have been uh, a different story had it been so close you could just couldn't call it. And even today we still wouldn't know who the winner was. That would be the worst outcome, I think. I think the market was just happy that there was an outcome uh, and priced in a victory uh, for, uh, not so much for Biden, but priced in a decisive victory for one party at least. Problem is, is you still have a loser in the White House who does not like losing and is not going to set Biden up for success. Uh, will most likely follow a scorched earth policy and sabotage and burn down as much as he possibly can to set Biden up for failure because they're looking to the midterms, they're looking to 2024, and the more they can do to, to uh, uh, put the Democrats in a losing situation, they will. Now, what happens in Washington is separate from what happens on Main Street. But there are some things that you just need to come out of Washington uh, uh, that, that you're going to need them to work together. Not going to happen. It's just, they're just not going to work together. The big unknown here are the two January uh, elections in Georgia. If, if the Democrats take it, uh, then my U.S. Uh, dollar story that I'm going to unfold uh, is even uh, it will be even more pronounced and uh, if the Democrats do take it I think you'll get your correction very quickly in January uh, because it'll be very likely that corporate tax rates will go up uh, and you could get two to three multiples chopped off uh, the S&P so if earnings are projected at 160 uh, and you get two to three multiples off the S&P you're looking at 320 to 480 points down only because that will belong to the government. That will be the taxes that the companies are giving to shareholders right now. Well, the shareholders are going to have to give that to the government. Well, you're not going to pay for the government's multiple. That's going to come out. Anyways, that's where I think we are. Uh, I, I think uh, we have a higher probability of a recession coming forward. And uh, because of that, and because of a, a number of other things, uh, these things here have affected uh, my decision. So let's get to each of them. Uh, and when I finish with cap rates, uh, you'll understand why I pretty much uh, uh, moved all out of REITs. And it wasn't really my intention. It just sort of started and the market just kept giving me gains and giving me gains. Every day I'd show up higher, higher. So, well, I got to take them. Um, about 25% of all the positions I've sold are a little higher than when I sold them. 75% are now lower uh, than when I sold them. So Avalon Bay, for example, dumping it in the 190s, it's now in the 170s. Uh, so $20 per share uh, downside. So uh, I feel uh, pretty good uh, about what I did. Uh, and now it's time to think about what I'm gonna get back into. Let's touch on that. All right, let's look at cap rates. And uh, cap rates uh, are uh, how uh, property prices uh, when, uh, in, in real estate are generally priced. Is, is we take uh, a cash flow 
and we'll divide it by the cap rate and you'll come up with a property value. The cap rate really is sort of, um, it's like a cash flow yield uh, uh, for, for the property itself. Uh, so to determine the, uh, the property value uh, of any commercial uh, real estate, uh, you would in your numerator place your next 12 months of net operating income. Uh, and you can refer to any of the two uh, readings in uh, alternative investments at level two uh, to um, learn more about uh, net operating income, the calculation of net operating income and cap rates. Uh, your denominator is your cap rate. Your cap rate is typically your cost of, uh, of the project, cost of, of uh, the capital minus any particular growth rate and it's your NOI growth. So whatever your numerator happens to be growing at, uh, you would uh, uh, reduce your cost of capital by the growth rate that gives you your cap rate, which gives you your property value. Uh, and cap rates uh, are mean reverting. Right now, cap rates are super, super low. Uh, and when they're super, super low, property values are super, super high. Uh, well, I don't know that cap rates can go any lower, so I don't know if any of the gains in the last 10 years from property value increases can continue in the next 10 years. In fact, I don't see property value gains. Uh, I see property value losses. I see fair value uh, write downs uh, on a lot of different properties because I think that their numerator is going to be under pressure. I don't think uh, the growth in uh, NOI that we've seen over the last 10 years is going to uh, be there for the next 10 years. I think it's going to be subdued, especially retail. Uh, office will be under pressure, uh, although I think that everyone's going to return to the office. Um, apartment buildings, I think, will be okay, but still, I think that, uh, that NOI will be lower than what uh, the average NOI will be lower. It's the cost of the capital that I think will increase. So I think cap rates are set to begin to increase um, <clears throat> in part because of increasing uh, costs uh, or increasing perceived riskiness of commercial real estate and the riskier it is, well, the higher the cost of the capital required uh, for those projects and uh, because of downward pressure or headwinds uh, on net operating income. Uh, so for that, I think that you're going to have uh, a trajectory of net operating income that may have looked like that, that's now going to look like this. I think your growth uh, in your numerator is going to be uh, lower, and I think your property values uh, are going to take a fair value hit. So while you may still get uh, a dividend yield off of these properties and off of REITs, uh, you're going to basically give it back in the share value with lower and lower uh, property prices. I don't see property crash. I just see a slow adjustment downwards as cap rates begin to inch up. Uh, so what you're getting on one hand, you're giving back on the other. Um, another issue with some of these um, REITs is the uh, dividend uh, uh, is the yields are sub 4%. Some of them are 2.5% up to 4%, 4.5%. You can get find some that are 10, 11%, but uh, uh, you know, uh, those kind of dividends come with very, very, very low growth and they're still going to be facing uh, 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 property value, uh, I think, declines. Well, listen, these are non-qualified dividends. Uh, Non-qualified meaning that you're getting a dividend that was not taxed. So as far as the tax authority is concerned, that's income. That's the same as getting interest. You're taxed on it at your marginal tax rate. Well, I can get the same dividend yield from a Canadian bank. Now that's a qualified dividend, which means I have a lower tax rate on that. So after tax, I do better with bank dividends than I do with REIT dividends. Um, the days of six and a half, seven percent yields. Uh, I don't think I'm going to see that for a while. Um, as REIT prices tend to drop, the yields will continue to go back up. But again, you have NOI under pressure. So for that, uh, you know, I look at where I've been making money for the last 10 years. And sometimes you have to sort of throw everything out. Uh, and it's one, this is uh, the time where during the month of November, as I was selling my positions, I kept thinking, you know, I'm, I think this is, you know, I'm getting two, two years, one to two years of returns in this month. 
I don't see this getting any better. Uh, I think this is it. That's the big stuff. And I can see some bigger stuff on the horizon. Uh, so uh, I sort of backed out of that altogether. Um, I'm not uh, negative or really bearish on REITs, uh, but uh, I think they're going to underperform at least for the next three or four years. But if I'm looking at a 10 year, if I had to buy something for 10 years and go away, it just wouldn't be REITs uh, at this point in time. Let's uh, keep uh, going through the arguments. I will uh, put more videos out in, in uh, the uh, weeks coming because December is a, a nice easy month. Uh, it's not a very busy month uh, uh, for me. I can put out more videos explaining all of these in a little bit more detail. I just don't want this to be two hours long. I'm, I'm really trying to keep it down in, in terms of how long you have to listen to me. Let's move on to uh, large cap versus small cap. Now, to make the argument I'm about to make, uh, I have to use uh, the very first argument uh, that I talked about is the move, the more rapid move to a digital world. Their size matters. Uh, and the bigger you are, the faster you can drive your marginal costs down. Um, the other argument it has to do with the US dollar and why a large cap company is probably a preferable place to be than a small cap company. Uh, so right away, scalability favors size. Uh, and um, large companies are getting the lowest marginal cost. And contrary to a traditional world that we used to live in where diseconomies of scale would start to raise your marginal cost, because if you remember economics, level one, when we drew marginal cost curves, they looked uh, um, like this. So that marginal costs would shrink to a certain point and then they'd start to rise after size started to get too big. Well, now you can, you can uh, legitimately have a marginal cost curve that keeps shrinking with size. Scalability matters. Large firms are better positioned for scalability. Uh, so I'm looking at the SPY and um, I want to take positions in leaps. Leaps are long, uh, long dated options, more than a year. Um, what is interesting about the premiums on the SPY, uh, SPY right now is you can put on a risk reversal and a risk reversal is buying an out of the money call and selling an out of the money put to finance it. If you go 10% up from where the market is uh, and you buy a call, you can finance it with a put that's 20% down. That is, that is nicely asymmetric. I don't have to go 10% down to finance a call that's 10% up. I don't have a symmetrical uh, 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 movement uh, or I don't have uh, symmetry around the current price. I have 10% up and almost 20% down. Actually, it's like 8.99% up and uh, almost 20% down. Uh, why wouldn't I do that? So I'm looking at, uh, at doing that on the SPY. Uh, I like the SPY because it's, uh, we think of it as a US index. The companies are US domiciled. It's not a US index. It is a global index. Um, almost, uh, I think 45, almost 50% of revenues of the S&P 500 are global, are outside the US. Uh, the other 50% are internal. So to me, that's, that's an international index. That's, that's not an index that is uh, purely uh, got exposure to the US economy uh, if, if uh, revenues, 50% of revenues can occur uh, outside the US. Um, the, other, um, the other side of this why I prefer large cap to small cap. Number one, large cap will have more international exposure than small cap, but it's the direction of the US dollar. Uh, and I think the US dollar will continue to weaken uh, from this point. Um, the Canadian dollar, the US Canadian dollar pair right now is about 128. That means one US dollar can get a dollar 28 Canadian. I think by this time next year, we're gonna be in the 115 to 118 range which is uh, roughly about 10%, 10 down or 10% strength on the uh, Canadian dollar. Uh, it doesn't work out evenly like that. It's not like 10% down on one is 10% up on the other, but close enough that I can say 10%. So if I'm going to take a position in a U.S.-based stock that I think is going to increase 10%, if I'm not going to hedge my currency, I will lose 10% on the exchange, or I anticipate that I would lose 10%. Uh, so uh, as I was lightening up on my U.S. REIT holdings, that was a, a, another good reason as well. I really don't want to have to get into currency hedging every day. And I think 
uh, if I continue to hold, not only will these prices drop down, but the Canadian dollar will continue to strengthen, that US dollar will weaken, I'll lose on the currency exchange as well. So let's repatriate uh, dollars now. Uh, so if, if the US dollar is going to weaken, and I think it's going to weaken broadly against uh, uh, all uh, the currencies that are out there, all the important currencies, well, you're going to get Forex gains uh, on companies that have international exposure. So companies that generate a lot of the revenues uh, in other currencies, well, when they translate those currencies into the domestic currency to present their results, they're going to have currency conversion gains or currency translation gains. For those of you uh, at level two who have been through FRA, we have a whole reading on uh, currency translation. Uh, and we know that if, you, uh, if the domestic currency is weakening and the foreign currency is strengthening and you're translating foreign currencies into the domestic currency, you'll end up with a positive translation adjustment. So it's going to be a boost to earnings. Uh, uh, small cap companies tend to have more domestic uh, uh, exposure as opposed to international exposure. Not that they don't, they just don't have it to the extent of large cap. Um, and uh, small cap uh, companies don't have the scalability, the, the size uh, that large caps do, uh, where that scalability really matters. Now, if you're a small cap company competing in the same space as a large cap, how are you going to compete when your uh, competitors' marginal costs are significantly lower than yours and can only go lower uh, with size? Not only that, large cap companies uh, do have a track record of acquisition. They tend to acquire a lot of small cap private companies. Uh, so what are you getting when you uh, move into a large cap index is, is you're getting uh, exposure to an international market. You are getting exposure through small caps because these big guys are eating the small companies and you're actually getting exposure to private equity because when they're buying these companies, uh, they tend to be uh, private companies. So I think large cap is really what I want exposure to, uh, not small cap, for, uh, for the scalability uh, factor uh, and for the US dollar factor as well, because I think that that's going to continue to decrease and I see a lot of uh, uh, translation gains uh, for large cap companies. Let's, uh, so I'm bearish on, on the US dollar. Uh, uh, I'm um, not, not so much that I'm bullish on the Canadian dollar. I, I, I can't find a, a compelling reason why there should be uh, Canadian dollar strength. It's just I do see uh, significant US dollar strength going forward. If the Democrats uh, win these two seats in Georgia, um, you're going to have you're going to have more stimulus and you're going to have a big stimulus bill and that's going to add to the deficit and add to the debt which is going to weigh uh, on the dollar uh, even more if you don't you're not going to get stimulus and that's going to weigh on growth i think that no matter how it works out the translation is going to be negative for the us dollar uh, if the republicans take it i think it'll be negative for the us dollar and negative for the markets uh, um, uh, sorry, not negative for the market, but negative for the U.S. dollar because nothing will get done. Uh, if the Democrats take it, I think it'll be negative uh, for the U.S. dollar. And that's a beautiful trade when no matter what happens, you think it's negative for the U.S. dollar. But I also think it's going to be short term negative for the markets because uh, tax rates uh, are going to increase. Although, let's be honest here, uh, there, is, there is nothing saying that markets can't rise uh, with higher taxes. There's nothing uh, to say that. Uh, they, they have done that in the past. Uh, in fact, I think some of the best gains have come under Democratic leadership, not Republican leadership. Anyways, uh, let's move on to commodity cycles. Uh, and we'll talk about localization versus globalization. We'll talk about inflation. And inflation really feeds... Uh, my story uh, for uh, commodities uh, as well. And a weak US dollar also feeds the story for commodities. All right, let's uh, look at the uh, commodity super cycle. I'm sure you've heard this, uh, this term before. Uh, the commodity super cycle tends to be, and I say tends, because whenever we start talking about cycles and, and leaning more towards the technicals, uh, I'm very skeptical of precision, uh, but tends to be a 30-year cycle. So from peak to peak or from trough to trough, 
uh, tends to be about a 30-year period. Not exactly, but you know, close enough that you can say, hey, it looks like it's a 15-year boom followed by 15-year bust or 15-year bull followed by 15-year bear. The last uh, super cycle uh, uh, pretty much uh, uh, started in 95 to 98 and lasted to about 2008, 2010. Uh, and this was China's entrance into the WTO. And of course, uh, we know what happened with commodity prices over that period of time. Oil, I think, peaked somewhere in the 150s uh, pre, uh, pre-mortgage pre uh, meltdown in 2008. Uh, and then we entered into a commodity bear market uh, where we saw energy prices uh, pull back quite considerably. In fact, it went negative at one point. But $40 compared to uh, $100 uh, previous to that, copper prices ha have come down. Um, some commodity prices are higher than they were, but overall, if you look at a commodity index, which is a, a weighting of, of different commodities, you'll notice that it is significantly below uh, where it was uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but I think uh, we're going to be troughing sometime in 2021. Uh, and uh, and entering or setting up for the next 15-year, uh, 10 to 15-year uh, bull run in commodities. We're, we're down on the uh, lower leg of the super cycle and about to uh, move up. Now, what makes the move into commodities or what makes uh, um, you know, my decision to uh, start thinking about commodity exposure uh, more compelling is the U.S. dollar as well. Uh, because commodities globally tend to be priced in U.S. dollars, and if the U.S. dollar is weakening, uh, suddenly I want more U.S. dollars if I'm going to give you a pound of copper. Uh, because if we look at commodities priced in different currencies, I don't think that they're going to see the same upward swing as commodities priced in U.S. dollars, because as the U.S. dollar gets weakened, you need more U.S. dollars to buy the same quantity of gold, the same quantity of silver or copper, etc. So if you are a dollar bear, uh, you almost have to be, by default, a commodity uh, bull on this one. It just strengthens the commodity story. I would be looking uh, to get exposure to a commodity index or a commodity ETF, X Energy. Uh, now, I know I skipped over the top part over here. I'll get back to it in, in a second. But I would not want exposure to energy. And most commodity indices have almost 20, 30, 40% weighting towards energy. I wouldn't want that. Uh, because I think EV is going to be a big trend over the next five years, much bigger and much faster uh, than most people think. So I, I, I want exposure to commodities, but I don't want exposure uh, to energy, and I don't want exposure to food. It has its own peculiarities that go on. So I really want uh, a total return index that does not have exposure to food or energy. You can Google that. There's eight or nine uh, of them out there. I'll talk more about that in a later video. I'm looking at a couple right now. Uh, I just want to see how they behave in terms of, they have options, which is the nice thing. I want to see how they behave in terms of their options, in terms of the volume per day, its liquidity, the spread, uh, because I haven't used one of these in the past and I am going to use one, not now, but, uh, but uh, sometime after January, after I get more clarity, I'm going to be looking to add probably a 5% position uh, exposed purely just to commodities, X energy, X food. Um, and um, let's talk about EV before I talk about uh, inflation. Inflation is also something that supports uh, the commodity uh, cycle as well. And it also is an argument of why I think cap rates uh, are going to increase. But let's look at EV, electric vehicles. Uh, GM has announced that it's going to move the Hummer, uh, I think, to fall of 2021, a Hummer pickup, uh, at least as far as I can remember, uh, into um, EV, uh, and that it will um, move its whole line eventually into EV. And another, a couple of car companies have already announced that by 2025 or 2030, they'll com be completely EV. Some countries, I think uh, the UK has said, hey, by 2030, that's it for internal combustion being sold in this country. It'll all be EV. Uh, California, I think, leads the U.S. in terms of, of what it demands from uh, car companies. You've seen some car companies back out of that lawsuit uh, that, that uh, the, the Trump administration is leading against California, uh, saying your standards are far too rigid that you can't do this. Some of them have backed out saying, you know what, we don't want to be part of it. We're good with it. We're moving to EV. Um, Tesla is, has been the leader there, uh, but I think that they're, they're more than priced in. Um, 
GM sells far more vehicles uh, than Tesla. And the reason um, we think about a Tesla is if you want an EV, you got to take what the market has at this point in time. You don't get to pick. You don't say, well, I'll take the F-150 with an EV engine. I mean, you could pick the six cylinder or the eight cylinder, but you can't pick the EV. Well, what if you could? Uh, would Tesla have the demand that Tesla has if you could get that uh, in, in an ordinary vehicle? Now I get the whole computer on the road idea and that you get upgrades and it upgrades each year. Car companies are not, uh, are not ignorant to that fact at all. Uh, so I, I don't think that this is just a monopoly uh, that Tesla has. Much like years ago, I said uh, streaming is not a, a, a monopoly that Netflix has. Uh, other companies are going to move into that space and do it themselves. And we're seeing that. Uh, so I don't know that I would be buying Tesla, but I would with GM. However, I don't want to own GM shares because I don't want to hedge out that dollar uh, constantly all the time. Um, what is interesting here is uh, January 2022. These are leaps. Again, very long dated options. The $40 put, and GM's over $45 right now as we speak. The $40 put has got a 560 premium. Uh, implied volatility of 26%, historical volatility uh, of 19%. And if we look at the January 2021 options, they're about 80 cents. Uh, that's two months away. Uh, January 22 is 14 months away. So there's seven. I could do two month options and roll them over. I could do that seven times, but seven times 80 is 560. Uh, I can get 560 right now at the $40 put. Uh, if I roll them over two months and GM starts moving upwards, I have to keep moving up my strike price uh, to get the same premium. Uh, and if implied volatility drops from 26% to 19% over a period of time, I'm not going to get a cumulative amount of 560. Not only that, I'm looking at two to 300 puts, uh, not just five or 10. Well, I don't want to have to roll over two to 300 puts uh, every, every two months. This is a nice thing, $5.60 on the $40 puts, which would make my cost 34.40. Uh, on a company that I think is better positioned uh, for the EV market and for growth uh, than Tesla currently is. Tesla wants a, a new factory. They build a new factory. GM's got a lot of capacity lying around. GM has got an amazing procurement system. In fact, I think they're probably one of the most efficient in terms of procurement. Uh, Tesla has a lot of debt on its balance sheet. GM has a lot of cash. GM sells a lot more vehicles, has a lot more distribution centers, uh, 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 a lot more maintenance centers uh, as well. Uh, so uh, I would gain EV exposure uh, through exposure to GM. However, I would be selling the puts. There's no point owning GM that's going to go up in price 10% every year if that currency is going to just take it away from me. You know, I want, uh, I want a, a convex return. I'll sell the puts. Yeah, it gives me U.S. dollars, but um, with portfolio margining, it's all, it's a zero cost because other securities in my portfolio act as margin securities I plan on keeping anyways, or that I uh, will uh, be planning on keeping anyways. So I'm not really concerned. So I've started with that. I've stepped back in. I've done some risk reversals on the SPY, uh, but I am looking to sell uh, the forty dollar puts for 2022, five sixty or better. Uh, so I'm going to take an initial position uh, over the next few weeks. Then I'm going to wait to see what the outcome of uh, the January elections are. Either way, I think we get a slight correction uh, off of that. But I think we, we probably see some weakness in January and February as the reality of COVID sets in. I'll be able to sell more of these. Hopefully maybe 6, 620, 650, 680. That would be nice. Uh, and then uh, just let that sit uh, uh, for a period of time. And uh, finally, let's uh, wrap up here with inflation. Uh, I have a localization versus globalization. And uh, as you can see from the video here, I'm losing the light. And uh, it is getting long. We're at about the 45-minute mark. And uh, I didn't really want to keep you this long. I will be breaking all of these topics out into, into their own video uh, later on. Uh, listen, the last 25 years, 30 years, has really been a story of globalization, increased globalization, uh, very stretched supply lines uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and that has driven costs out of the system. Even though prices have risen over that period of time, they would have risen much, much faster without globalization. Uh, but 
uh, there is a growing consensus that uh, globalization may not be the best thing uh, for each individual economy. Uh, so we have started seeing uh, a leaning towards localization. I don't know that that slows down. I don't know that that stops and says, okay, well, that was just a reaction to the last couple of years. Let's, let's head back uh, into globalization. I think the rise of right-wing parties was uh, uh, in part a response to the fallout of globalization uh, for certain segments of the population. Uh, and I think a, a healthy economy, even though you may have higher prices, a healthy economy is an employed economy. Uh, I think more places will be looking uh, to localize as opposed to uh, put up with globalization or to, to embrace globalization to the extent that they have. So I do see uh, an eventual shift back to localization. Well, if globalization squeezed costs out of the system and moderated inflation, reversing it will do the opposite. And I think you're going to see uh, inflation, something that we didn't think we'd see. And if we continue on the trajectory we're on right now, I don't think we will see it. I don't think you'll see inflation only because in a digital world, there is no potential uh, GDP. It's unlimited. Your potential is unlimited because you can continue to produce and produce uh, without end. You don't have to worry about having enough vinyl and the production system in place to put music on a vinyl disc and ship it out to a store. You can download millions and billions and billions of the same song and never, ever, ever have to worry about inventory. There is no capacity uh, constraint uh, in that respect. So uh, a return of inflation will start to push up nominal rates even if a central bank uh, doesn't do anything. Now, inflation actually is a benefit for governments uh, because if there's a sales tax in place, uh, government revenues will rise at the pace of inflation. So if you pay $100 for something and there was a 5% tax, you'll give the government $5. If inflation is 4%, then you'll pay 104 for the average basket of goods, but you'll pay 520 to the government on a 5% sales tax. Revenues just went up 4%. Uh, so government revenues can increase with inflation without tax rates increasing. So even if nominal rates increase by the amount of inflation, tax revenues increase by the amount of inflation, it's net neutral. So it's not as if higher interest rates will make government debt more difficult to finance. Higher interest rates as a result of the inflation component increasing will be neutral. Uh, so I don't know that there'll be uh, that much of a fight to stop inflation, and we know the central bank wants it. Uh, so when it does show up, I don't think, uh, I don't think that it, it will be fought too difficultly. Well, if nominal uh, rates are going up because the inflation component is going up, what do you think is going to happen uh, to the cost of capital? It's going to go up because it's going to have to have that hurdle rate in there for the inflation component, which means cap rates are going to go up. Um, in rents tend to increase with the rate of inflation as well, but I think it's a long time before retail uh, will be able to increase its rents. I think office will be under pressure for a while. Uh, so there again is, is just, you know, yet another reason why in November when these all popped, I said, that's that's my opportunity. Let's, let's do like Seinfeld, exit at the top. Why write it uh, down and, and exit 10 or 15% lower than there? So that's it. Now, uh, one last point here. Uh, if, if we do have a return of inflation and nominal yields start to increase, that is going to provide competition to the equity market. Uh, because the marginal investor, as uh, nominal rates rise, the marginal investor will say, well, if I'm deploying new capital, I can go into bonds, which have this yield, or I can go into uh, equities, which have this yield. It will start to provide uh, some competition uh, for equities, and it will start to moderate uh, that multiple. So, uh, you know, how that's going to unfold at this point in time depends on how quickly inflation does show up if, if we have this move towards localization. Anyways, I've, I've kept you way too long here. Uh, thank you for watching all the way to the end, if you have watched all the way to the end. Uh, I will put out more videos over the next couple of weeks, breaking each one of these down a little bit further and giving you some uh, uh, ideas about what I'm going to be doing. And the typical disclaimer, you know, don't copy me. I'm, I'm showing you how I'm applying what, what we learn, how I'm applying it in the marketplace. 
That does not mean that I am suggesting that you do it. I'm just showing you an example uh, of how I'm taking that perspective or that uh, 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 my uh, sort of translation of what the environment looks like and putting it into action. That's it.